Hello, my name is Douglas Guilfoyle, and in this short recording I'd like to introduce the crime of aggression. Now, aggression was first described by the Nuremberg Tribunal as being the supreme international crime, and we'll come to that in a moment, but certainly uh, the prohibition on unlawful war uh, has been a cornerstone of the post-1945 order as symbolised by the knotted gun statue found outside United Nations headquarters in New York. So it was said by the International Military Tribunal in its judgment at Nuremberg, to initiate a war of aggression is not only an international crime, it is the supreme international crime, differing only from other war crimes in that it contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole. So as at 1945, this was taken to be the major international crime genocide emerging later as being thought of as the preeminent crime. And there are a number of historical instruments that lead up to uh, the appearance of genocide as a codified, sorry, of aggression as a codified crime in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Uh, many of those are listed here and certainly uh, the 1974 General Assembly resolution, the definition of aggression, we'll come back to later as that has been taken up as giving us a, a list of acts indicative of what might constitute aggression. But certainly for the purposes of the Nuremberg Tribunal, the 1928 Kellogg-Briand Pact was significant. This was a treaty renouncing recourse to war for uh, the solving of diplomatic disputes. And it was essentially an agreement binding only inter partes, saying that they renounced war as an instrument of foreign policy. The Nuremberg Tribunal derived from that uh, a foundation for criminalization of recourse to illegal war, um, although that perhaps derivation wasn't particularly strongly supported by the Kellogg-Briand Pact itself, which made no provision for direct criminal responsibility. In any event, it was a difficult crime to incorporate into the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, not having been prosecuted since 1945 and the Nuremberg Tribunal. So in 1998, the attempt to define aggression could perhaps have derailed the negotiation of the Rome Statute, Statute as a whole. There certainly wasn't going to be time to finish with such a controversial issue in the time available to negotiate the statute. So what was agreed was that in principle, the court should have jurisdiction over the crime of aggression, but the parties couldn't agree how it was to be defined, uh, what jurisdiction the court would have over it, and what would be the trigger triggering mechanisms for investigation and prosecution. So all of those issues were deferred to a later meeting of the state parties, uh, of a meeting of the assembly of the state parties. So indeed, eventually in 2010, a review conference of the statute uh, at Kampala agrees to a definition of the crime of aggression, which results in further articles being added to the, tribun uh, to the tribunal statute. Articles 8 bis, 15 bis, 15 ter, and 23 3 bis. Now, when treaties are amended and additional articles are inserted, bis normally indicates a second insertion, ter a third insertion, and so forth. Now, all of these provisions had a delayed commencement date. So let's just reflect on this for a moment. These critical issues couldn't be defined as at 1998. Agreement on these issues took until 2010, but then at 2010, it was further agreed that the commencement of these provisions would be delayed once again. This indicates the controversy surrounding the idea of a crime of waging aggressive or illegal war. So what's the definition of aggression we find in Article 8 bis? Well, it has a number of material elements. Uh, it is targeted at the planning, preparation, initiation, or execution of an act of aggression. The perpetrator must be a person in a position effectively to exercise control over or to direct the political or military action of a state. So there's a leadership requirement. The underlying act, obviously enough, must be an act of aggression, and we'll come back to that. But then that act of aggression must be manifestly illegal. It must, by its character, gravity, or scale, 
constitute a manifest violation of the UN Charter. So all of these elements are required. Uh, that someone in a leadership position plans, prepares, initiates or executes an act of aggression. There must be something that meets a definitional requirement of being an act of aggression, and then that aggression must reach a certain threshold, that it must, by its character, gravity or scale, constitute a manifest violation of the UN Charter. So what intent elements are required? Uh, well, one must have intent and knowledge as to the planning, preparation, initiation or execution of the act of aggression, and one must have awareness of the factual circumstances establishing that this use of armed force was inconsistent with the UN Charter and constitutes a manifest violation of the UN Charter. Now that's the underlying factual circumstances, not a legal assessment as to the consequences. So let's turn to the leadership requirement. This idea that the perpetrator must be a person in a position effectively to exercise control over or to direct the political or military action of a state. This plainly reflects the post-World War II jurisprudence, particularly that of the Nuremberg Military Tribunal and the High Command case in the subsequent proceedings conducted under Control Council Law No. 10. The requirement is reiterated in Article 25.3 bis, which places this limit, uh, reinforces that this limit applies to the other modes of liability for aggression, and we'll talk about modes of liability for international crimes in a later recording. Um, notably, the ICC definition captures de facto as well as de jure positions of control, but it's limited to military and political leaders. So, uh, for example, senior advisers might not be captured by this definition, whereas they might have been captured by the approach of the post-World War II jurisprudence and it does not on its face include leaders of non-state organisations. All right, um, so what do we mean by planned, prepared, initiated or executed? So this is similar to the IMT Charter's planning, preparation, initiation or waging, uh, but waging risks potentially capturing a broader class of actors. In, in theory, the waging of a war of aggression could be carried out by any foot soldier, so that wording was particularly controversial. Uh, preparation is closely linked to planning, uh, the planning of a concrete act. Uh, we have to have more at hand than some uh, general preparation for a vague act in the future which might or might not be aggression. And this will require the court to look at the concrete circumstances on a case-by-case -case basis. More difficult is the idea of what will constitute an act of aggression. Well, uh, act of aggression in the elements means the use of armed force by a state against the sovereignty, territorial integrity or political independence of another state or in any other manner inconsistent with the Charter of the United Nations. So aggression is inextricably linked to this underlying state act. Uh, aggression can only be committed by a state against another state. Um, therefore determining an act of aggression is intrinsically linked to international law principles on the permissible use of force at international law. So ultimately an act of aggression for ICC purposes is probably going to be limited to large scale and serious instances of the unlawful use of force. But obviously this ties into the manifest illegality element. So what is a permissible use of force by a state under international law? Well Article 2.4 of the UN Charter provides all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. And that wording has obviously been taken up in the ICC elements. Now, there's a considerable general literature in public international law that disaggregates or unpacks some of these key concepts, such as what is a use of force against territorial integrity or political, political independence and so on. But the key things we should note is that essentially this is a blanket rule. The use of force against another state is on its face impermissible unless an exception can be made out. The key exception in international law is self-defense as uh, against an armed attack uh, as set out in Article 51 of the UN Charter. Now the response taken in self-defence must be necessary and proportionate, so a necessary and proportionate act in self-defence is not 
manifestly unlawful. But there are questions such as, is preemptive self-defence uh, permitted or anticipatory self-defence? So this could occur in varying degrees. Um, shooting down an incoming missile is likely to be, well, is obviously going to be within the concept of necessary and proportionate. There is no requirement that an innocent state wait until the first blow is struck. So one can act to some extent um, in uh, to preempt an attack that may be incoming, but to act in an entirely anticipatory way against uh, threats that have not yet arisen. Um, the perhaps uh, where a potentially hostile state might be developing capacities which at some point in the future might or might not be used for aggressive purposes, for example, probably goes beyond the bounds of what most scholars would consider legitimate self-defence. However, there will obviously be a spectrum of debatable cases from that of sort of an incoming missile, clearly one can take action in anticipation of that blow falling, to entirely preempting uh, or destroying uh, an adversary state's capacity to conduct hostile operations, which it might or might not do in a hypothetical future, which would obviously not be self-defence in response to an armed attack which had occurred or was imminent. The other possibility is Security Council authorization. So the Security Council has certain powers under Chapter 7 in respect of the, uh, in respect of response to threats uh, to international peace and security or breaches of the peace. And one form that might take is authorising states to act collectively under Chapter 7 to take forceful action. So in the case of self-defence or Security Council authorisation, that use of force would be permissible. Controversial questions include humanitarian intervention. Can you act in another state when uh, it is failing um, to deal with its own people? The reaction to that in uh, the international community has largely been the idea of the responsibility to protect. Insofar as that has a legal and not moral dimension, all we have are statements at the United Nations that where a state fails in its primary obligation to protect its own people, then collectively members of the United Nations acting through the Security Council and the UN system should take action. That has actually really been uh, the exception rather than the rule. There are very few cases where, unfortunately, the General Assembly and the Security Council have responded in a prompt, collective and timely way uh, to failures of protection. There's also the question of under what circumstances could one use force uh, against organised armed groups or terrorist groups present in another state, but where that state is somehow unable or unwilling to take action to prevent uh, those terrorists or organised armed groups acting against other states. So, for example, if you are suffering terrorist raids across a border, can you take armed action in that other state to um, confront that armed group? Now, the position of the United States, for example, is that yes, you can do that where that group, uh, where that territorial state is unable or unwilling to take action against the group. That, unf that approach, however, has not been taken by the majority of states in the international community. All right, what are the kind of acts that could qualify as an act of aggression? So invasion or attack by the armed forces of a state into the territory of another state uh, is always um, sufficient, including military occupation. Uh, bombardment of the armed forces of a state against the territory of another state or the use of weapons uh, by a state against the territory of another state uh, is always sufficient. The blockade of ports will be a sufficient act of aggression. Uh, an attack by the armed forces of a state on the land, sea or air forces or marine and air fleets of another state qualifies. Uh, it is sufficient that um, there is a use of armed forces of one state which are within the territory of another state with the agreement of the receiving state in contravention of the conditions provided for in the agreement or any extension of their presence in such territory beyond the termination of the agreement. So this example contemplates a situation where 
foreign forces are stationed within your territory with your consent, but then undertake activities to which you have not consented or overstay the duration of the agreement uh, for their being stationed within your territory. Uh, we then come to um, the action of a state in allowing its territory, which it has placed at the disposal of another state, to be used by that other state for perpetrating an act of aggression. So if you act as, say, uh, the host of airfields or ports being used to facilitate an act of aggression, you yourself are an aggressor. And finally, the sending by or on behalf of a state of armed bands, groups, irregulars or mercenaries which carry out acts of armed force against another state of such a gravity as to amount to the acts listed above or its substantial involvement therein. So if you organise irregular militias, armed bands or mercenaries to perpetrate acts of the same scale as you could with conventional armed forces, then what you have done through mercenaries, which you could have done with your own armies, is equally an act of aggression. And all of these examples are drawn from the UN General Assembly definition of aggression. Now, we then come to the question of, well, how do we make out this manifest violation of the UN Charter requirement? So there's this concept of manifest illegality. So this idea that uh, an act of aggression which by its character, gravity or scale constitutes a manifest violation of the UN Charter. So manifest is the word we need to focus on. And it's likely to enable the court to avoid determinations on uses of force where there's a genuine dispute amongst the international community of states as to its lawfulness. So marginal cases are unlikely uh, to qualify. However, this may create certain problems of predictability and of normative force around the rule though it does have the advantage that hopefully it will prevent the court from having to rule on too many controversial cases. So what are the intent and knowledge requirements for an act of aggression? Well, one needs intent and knowledge as to the planning, preparation, initiation or execution of the act of aggression, and awareness, as we've said, of the factual circumstances that established the use of armed force was inconsistent with the UN Charter, and uh, that make out it being a manifest violation of the UN Charter. There's no apparent requirement in the mental element for having an aggressive purpose, uh, a special intent requirement, or an intent to require, sorry, an intent to act contrary to the UN Charter. Now, we then come to some unique jurisdictional features of the aggression regime, and these are a little difficult to follow, but arise essentially out of Article 15 bis 4. So, first, the court having jurisdiction at all over aggression was not only subject to a definition of aggression being agreed. As we've noted, it was further, its coming into force was going to be delayed um, to a later date. So there was going to need to be an activation decision. And under the amendments, a decision to activate the court's jurisdiction over aggression had to be taken by a majority of state parties after 1 January 2017. And, as a further mechanism, no such decision um, could be effective until one year has passed after the first 30 state parties have ratified the aggression amendment. So you need this double hurdle, 30 ratifications plus an activation decision by a majority of states in the Assembly of State Parties. Now, as it happens, that decision came round almost as early as it possibly could. The earliest possible date for aggression become, uh, falling within the temporal jurisdiction of the court uh, was 2 January 2017. An activation decision was in fact taken on 4 December 2017, so acts after that date are now potentially within the court's jurisdiction. And that was taken by the Assembly of State Parties uh, to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court in paragraph one of uh, the resolution of the State Parties, um, resolution five of uh, Assembly of the State Parties uh, meeting number 16. However, we then go on to a, a very curious paragraph two of that resolution, which says that in the case of a state referral or proprio motu investigation, the court shall not exercise its jurisdiction regarding a crime of aggression when committed by a national or on the territory of a state party that has not ratified or accepted these amendments. And 
that bold text is my own. So in cases other than a Security Council referral, the aggression must have been committed by a national or on the territory of a state party that has ratified and accepted the amendments. Um, so this embodies a particular interpretation of uh, the Article 15 bis 4 opt-in provisions, which the ICC judges may or may not accept, because paragraph 3 of the resolution goes on to confirm the independence of uh, the ICC judiciary. So let's um, consider this in a little further detail. So under Article 15 bis, if the situation was initiated by a state referral or the prosecutor, then a number of further requirements are going to need to be met. First, the case is going to have to involve states that have consented to ICC jurisdiction. So first we need both the aggressor state and the victim state to be parties to the court. Either or both of those states have to have ratified the aggression amendments and under the peculiar drafting of the opt-in clause, the aggressor state must not have opted out of the aggression provisions. So then further on top of that, uh, the prosecutor considers that there has to be a reasonable basis to proceed and has to also ascertain whether the security council has made a determination of an act of aggression and the prosecutor must notify the UN Secretary General of the situation before the court. Now, this requirement reflects a debate about whether aggression should only ever be prosecuted following a Security Council referral. The idea being that because the Security Council has Chapter 7 powers to deal with international peace and security, and because aggression is a breach of international peace, then perhaps the court should only act where the Security Council has determined an act of aggression has taken place. This option was ultimately not popular with the state parties because it would have given the permanent members of the Security Council a veto over aggression ever being prosecuted, particularly any act of aggression perhaps by them. Nonetheless, some limited degree of deference to the role of the Security Council is shown by this Article 15 requirement that the prosecutor has to inquire, has the Security Council made a declaration on point? Now, where following six months has passed, the Security Council hasn't acted regarding the potential situation of aggression, then a pre-trial division of the ICC can authorise an investigation. However, um, these further elements are not required in the case of a Security Council referral, um, because plainly they exist only to give some deference to the Security Council and therefore aren't required if the Security Council itself has affected the referral. Finally, it's important to note that a determination of an act of aggression by an organ outside the International Criminal Court is without prejudice to the court's own findings. So the court might look to uh, whether the Security Council has characterised a situation as aggression or not, but that does not bind the court one way or another. Now, if you look at Article 15 bis, there is this complex provision. The states have to opt have to ratify the amendments, a form of opting in, but can then choose not to be bound by the amendment. Having ratified it, they can opt out. This is a very peculiar piece of drafting, but one way of understanding the likely consequences is the following table, which is that, you know, on the narrowest construction, it may be the case, and this appears to be the view of the, the state parties in the activation resolution, that in all cases, you need the aggressor state to have ratified the aggression amendments and not exercised the further opt-out. Then, um, and only in such cases, will you have jurisdiction. Uh, so the victim state, um, whether they have ratified or not, ultimately, on this particular interpretation, isn't particularly relevant. Uh, the controlling factor becomes whether the aggressor has ratified and not opted out. Now, other interpretations of the effect of Article 15 may be available, and they are discussed further in the textbook and in other sources. But this is the narrow view which appears to be that adopted by the state parties at present.
So, what are the implications? Well, one is whether this complex jurisdictional regime will disincentivize uh, states from joining the International Criminal Court. Uh, a further question is whether the delay will in any sense have assisted the court in preparing um, for the activation of the crime of aggression. And um, I'm not necessarily sure that it has. Indeed, if anything, the, the debate over what the aggression amendments mean in practice uh, has simply continued. Um, will the delay in its having come into force in any way have undermined um, the normative force of the provision? Well, perhaps not. One way of thinking of it is that though this has been a slow process, it's moved like a ratchet. It's a lever that has moved only in one direction. And even though it now requires uh, ratifications, essentially this um, edifice of law is being built brick by brick and it's only moving in one way and there is not going to be an easy way to dismantle it once achieved. And in a sense, this is a triumph of at least uh, legal drafting and technique in that the process has moved ineluctably forward in a way that is difficult to reverse. So while it is preceded only by slow increments, uh, in a sense, maybe that is the only way one could ever get to the criminalization of aggression. But a central difficulty is, will this crime being within the jurisdiction of the court, the crime of acts uh, of aggression, of unlawful war, mean that the court is going to be involved in much more politically controversial and sensitive decisions? And in such cases, uh, might that involvement undermine the function of, or even the, the legit legitimacy of and support for the court itself? Well, on such matters, um, the it will simply have to be seen with time whether aggression is ultimately a boon to the court uh, or a further challenge for what is at present a somewhat troubled institution. In any event, um, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found this interesting and I look forward to discussing these questions with you further in class.